And now, as you as, as you probably noticed, uh, a lot of the efforts that we're talking about, they heavily depend on the culture that is uh, built into the company because it all starts from understanding of the importance of measurements, measuring the right thing, measuring it the right way. And uh, Charity is gonna share her uh, experience building high productivity uh, teams and uh, learnings along the way. So with that, with further ado, let's transition to Charity's talk. Yay! The socio-technical path for high-performing teams and why it begins with observability. Okay. Teams. <laughs> what are they? Uh, well, small group of people, three to ten, usually who work together towards a common goal. Teams exist to build and support um, anything that is too big or too important for one person alone, right? Um, I kind of think of teams as being the abstraction interface for, you know, it's how we assign an amount of work to get done at a company. And it also means that like if somebody on the team goes on vacation or leaves, like it shouldn't actually like affect the roadmap, which helps us all work with, work with each other. Um, basically, Teams are like raid for human humans, uh, as well as a scaffolding for like the growth and development of each individual. Um, hello, my name is Charity, uh, Mipsy Tipsy on Twitter. I am an infrastructure engineer um, slash engineering manager uh, off and on for the past many years. I've been on call since I was 17. Uh, four and a half years ago, I co-founded a company called Honeycomb, uh, where we have been researching and investigating observability for modern systems. I am the co-author of Database Reliability Engineering. Uh, if you happen to own this book and you would like to fix the cover so it has a unicorn instead of a horse, just send me your address. I'll hook you up. Uh, and I'm also the co-author of a book on observability with Liz Fong Jones, which isn't out yet. So. <sighs> Anyway, um, teams, the teams that you join will define your career far more than anything else I can think of, more than work-life balance, more than the specific, specific technologies, more than, seriously, your own individual skill. Uh, you know, I talk to people pretty often who are thinking about changing jobs, and when I ask them what they want out of their next job, I hear a lot of things. Um, company culture, um, you know, work-life balance, etc. But I don't think I've ever heard anyone say the thing that I think is by far the number one most important thing to look for, and that is this. You should want to join a high-performing team. Uh, I got lucky early in my career, uh, right after college, <laughs> right after dropping out of college, <laughs> clarification, uh, I went to Linden Lab. I was there for five and a half years, and that was a great place to work, right? They were doing cutting edge problems. They were really passionate about what they were doing. We had hard problems. We were doing distributed systems before, you know, th these were a thing. Um, I learned a lot and it really set the bar high for all the jobs that I've had after that. And there have been a couple of doozies <laughs> which which were not that great. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the bad, quote unquote, bad jobs that I've had have been very different from each other. Like almost nothing alike, um, except that they made me hate everything about work. Uh, I've never been as burned out, as close to burned out as I was the year that I worked at a company where I worked about one hour a day, maybe two, uh, just converting Word setup documents into puppet manifests, and they thought it was amazing, and I could barely make myself log in. <laughs> it was really, 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 really discouraging. Um, a lot of people, you know, 
a lot of people talk like, you know, they want they want work life balance, they they want strict, you know, boundaries between life and work. I I actually feel that we are fortunate to work in an industry and in a field where um, it, I consider engineering to be a very creative software engineering. <laughs> Building software is a is a creative outlet. Um, we get to do things that, something that has a huge amount of impact, you know. And if you Dan Pink's research on on you know what people want in their jobs really comes down to three things. It is we crave um, mastery, uh, we crave autonomy, and we crave um, meaning. I I want to I don't want to work at something that I could give a sh- I could care less about. I want to work at a job that you know. It's, it's a part of me. It's, you spend a third of your of your life at work or working. To me, I, I feel like um, we're incredibly fortunate to be in a field where our creative labor is highly compensated, highly valued. And I think that means we owe it to ourselves to hold out for jobs that, that are worthy of us, to hold out for jobs that are challenging, to hold up for jobs that are working on things that make the world a better place and and not to stick right. and I feel like we too often we reward bad employers by staying too long because we you know we like the team or whatever and I wish that we wouldn't I, I just I think that we need to get much better at moving on <laughs> getting new jobs um, and working for people working with people who who are responsible with that power um, da, da, da. kind, inclusive coworkers, all these things, they're great, but a high performing team is, um, is worthy, is worth chasing on its own. Also, like once you've, once you've been in a high performing team once, it's kind of like exercising or weight training where like once you've reached a certain level of achievement, it will be so much easier to reach for that for the rest of your life. You'll have better instincts that will help you raise the level that your teams perform on literally for the rest of your career. It is worth pursuing these jobs. But what does that even mean? High performing teams, right? Uh, honestly, until a couple years ago, uh, it would have been bullshit. It would have been purely my opinion and never someone else's opinion. Uh, but now, thanks to Nicole and Jez and and, Je- and Jean, um, they've done science. <laughs> they've done science on this, and this is, is excellent science. If you haven't read this, the Dora report, the State of DevOps report that they've published every year for the past few years, <clears throat> uh, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Please read it. Um, and Accelerate is the uh, longer book length version of, of the same same material. Um, Nicole is an amazing data scientist, uh, and basically, they 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 talk to thousands, tens of thousands of teams, and 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 what they came up with is they said that you know what you, your team's performance can be boiled down to four questions, four key metrics, um, and they are. How often do you deploy? How long does it take for your code to go live? How many of your deploys fail? How long does it take to recover from an outage? And I personally would add a fifth. Um, How often are you paged outside work hours? And every engineering manager, every engineering leader out there should be watching these. You You should know your numbers. You should know where you stand. Uh, even if you want to quibble with them, like you should know, you owe it to your people to know. Uh, it's really, if you want to use Honeycomb, you can do this with a, like a couple of cron jobs, a couple of scripts in a few minutes. It's worth doing. Track these. <laughs> when they start to slip, it's your, it's your leading indicator that you're going to lose good people. Um, when you look at the results though, there is a crazy wide gap between the quote unquote elite teams and the bottom half. Uh, look at these numbers here. Uh, lead time for changes for elite teams, less than an hour. Cool. For medium performing teams, between a week and a month. <laughs> okay. Uh, how often do you deploy? Uh, between a week and a month. How long does it take to restore service? A day? Between one week and one month. What the fuck? <laughs> Change failure rate, 46 to 60%. This is insane. 
it gets even better. Look, <laughs> if you look at 2018 versus 2019, the bottom half, half of all teams in the world, the bottom half is actually losing ground. I, this this is so the the bottom half is losing ground, but meanwhile the top half is like uh, achieving escape velocity. <laughs> there are more three times as many elite performers as there were the year before, and and they're getting better. They're getting better faster. It really pays off to be on a high performing team, like a lot. Like <laughs> okay, two hundred and eight times more frequent code deployments. 2,600 fa times faster to recover from incidents. <sighs> so I feel like this is, ac this is a good time to point out um, we, 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 we have this idea of ourselves as being, you know, an individualist. You know, I am, you know, and even if we aren't egotistical, you, you have an idea of, you know, where you're at. You know, you're above average developer. You're a whatever, how, how well you perform. But I would argue, I would argue strongly um, that far less of that is within your control than you probably think. Um, because what happens when an engineer from the elite bubble joins a team in the, you know, bottom half? You join them. And conversely, like I've seen engineers who are, you know, had been at mediocre teams all their lives, never been, you know, a superstar or whatever. They join a high performing team and within six months, they are performing up to par. There is so much, there is so almost indescribably much uh, of, of what goes into building software is not the data structures and algorithms in your head shocker right <laughs> it's it's the conventions it's the it's the um it's the tooling it's the processes it's the it's the tribal knowledge it's the it's everything that is bound up in you know this is why you know it's 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 a traditional traditional it's a kind of a well-known joke you know like a google engineer leaves google and is cocky and you know, struts off to the next thing and has a very rude awakening. <laughs> Suddenly realizes how much this is an enormous iceberg of dependencies that he or she was leaning on every day just to get code out the door, and they, they didn't even know that it existed. <sighs> That's not all. <laughs> if you've seen the Stripe Developer Report, um, they surveyed again tens of thousands of engineers and. Uh, Almost half of engineers' work week goes to the shit that you have to do in order to get the sh to the shit that you have to do, right? It's stuff that doesn't move the business forward. It's stuff that's not creative. It's not interesting. It's not It's not debugging something fun or anything. It's just like plowing step by step, trudging through the stuff that like the bullshit that you have to get. The build is broken. You know, tests are broken. Uh, you know, a bug got reported and then you can't find it or you fixed the wrong thing. <sighs> What's even more terrifying is that we're just all like, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, about half my life, just kind of, <sighs> this is not okay. It's really not okay. Um, it's not okay. Um, so, like, people, you know, their first question is always, so how do we build these high-performing teams? And the Valley is notorious for coming up with the worst possible answer, which is, just hire the best engineers. <laughs> then you'll have the best team. That is bullshit. Um, I'm going to assume that you <laughs> all know this. You can't just hire, like, the smartest kids at MIT and be a great team. Skill at data structures and algorithms do not necessarily trans translate, do not necessarily do not translate into the kind of high-performing team as captured by, say, the Dora metrics. Even though, I would argue, the reverse is true. Working on a high-performing team does tend to create great engineers. <laughs> if you doubt me, consider this. Who's going to be the better engineer in two years? The 
person here who is, you know, an elite performing team versus the dude who's in the medium performing team, which is not terrible, right? It's like, it's like median. <sighs> Every time you get to deploy, that's an experiment. That's something to learn, right? You are proving a hypothesis or you are, you know, you're seeing whether it worked or not. You're seeing whether users use it or not, right? Somebody working on an elite team and shipping at the rate of 12 deploys per day is going to see 3,000 deploys in a year. Who do you think is going to be a better engineer after that year? Or, you know, what's in their time sink? Firefighting. <laughs> well, elite teams have one-seventh as many outages and res resolve them again 2,600 times faster. Firefighting is um, occasionally fun and you find it fun and interesting bug, but mostly it's just like... It's just drudgery and it's not, it's, you know, you've got your adrenaline pumping and it's, it's exhausting for you, but you're not learning something. <sighs> this is not um, data though. It's just anecdata, but I've seen it over and over throughout my career and I suspect you have too. How do we build high performing teams? Well, so I would argue that the problem is with the question because, you know, as long as your your eyes are trained, you know, on the people and the team, um, you're going to miss the point, which is it's a system. And a better question might be, how do we improve the overall functioning um, of our socio-technical system so that the team can then operate at a much higher level? level of efficiency. Um, hmm. This is a systems problem. So if, if you haven't heard the term socio-technical, this is absolutely my new favorite word. Uh, <laughs> and you already know intuitively what it means and why it matters, right? That's why it's so great. We can't build tools without considering how the people will use those tools, right? And in fact, if you change the tools that people use, you can change their behavior and you can even change who they are. Like, whoa. <laughs> um, you know, I feel like one lesson of the past century has been just how much of who we are is socially constructed. You are literally a different person who acts and thinks in different ways when you are in a classroom with your friends versus at work versus, you know, with your grandparents or traveling through Europe. Uh, and tech is such an incredibly powerful tool for changing, you know, for, for this interplay of like actions and reactions and, and tools and, and ultimately this is changing who we are. <laughs> That's so cool. <clears throat> but let's look at uh, Dr. Richard Cook's famous graph about socio-technical systems. Um, values are like, you know, above the line, individuals, right? What matters? Why does it matter? How should it work? Um, practices, tools are the artifacts, right? And the practices are everything that's in between. So if you were to map this, uh, if you were to map this to, to our system, we have a team of humans, we have production systems, and we have the tools and processes. Um, that that are like the, the the everything from the deploy scripts and you know the um, the on call rotations and if you doubt <laughs> if you doubt that um, you can change people's uh, change people with your tools imagine that every imagine I wrote a, a, a a cron job so that every time a test that you wrote failed, it would email the entire company, your name, test broke prod, and paged your manager too. How do you think that would affect your your team's velocity and or willingness to take risks? <laughs> These feedback loops are killer, man. Feedback loops Feedback loops are everything. I feel like a manager's job in tech is to curate feedback loops, full stop. Uh, and so is observability, because you cannot see what you cannot, you cannot change what you cannot see or measure. Uh, going back to, <laughs> oh 
All right. Well, you know, why are computers hard? <laughs> we don't understand them, and we keep shipping code anyway, right? Like our 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 systems are these giant gross hairballs that no one has ever understood and we keep shipping code every day that we don't understand to join the code that's never been understood and the hairball just gets bigger and more opaque and nobody wants to touch it because it's probably going to die when you do none of us have been none of us have really learned how to debug these things right it's it's entirely like flipping it's my alarm flipping through dashboards and formulating guesses and then going to see, like, look for evidence that our guess was correct. Like, that's not, that is not scientific. That's not debugging. That's not taking it one step after the other and, like, looking at the results and, and making another, you know, I, okay. And vendors have been part of the problem, like, for fucking sure. Vendors have been like, you do not have to understand your systems. I promise you. You just give me tens of millions of dollars, and I will make it so that nobody has to, I will tell you what to look at, I'll tell you what it means, and you don't have to do sh anything. And, and that's just a lie. That's just a straight up lie. At the end of the day, somebody is going to have to understand your system, and you're better off if lots of people understand your system. It is time to change this. Um, and it's time to change this by addressing the problem as a socio-technical, holistic whole um, by tending to our feedback loops and it starts with observability so I'm gonna just I'm gonna I'm gonna define observability driven development for you in a moment because that's the primary lever the Archimedes lever by which you know I you can change the world that's your lever but before we go to observability driven development let's look at what observability is because fundamentally what I'm asking you to do here is use your tools and processes to improve your tools and processes. Um, I keep forgetting to switch my slides, don't I? Practice ODD. Yes, thank you. Cool. Observability. I'm going to guess by the time I'm speaking, this will have been defined a few times, um, however, from Wikipedia. Um, in control theory, observability is a measure of how well, blah, 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 mathematical tools. Um, and four and a half years ago, when we started Honeycomb, uh, this, 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 like, nobody was really using the term observability except as a generic synonym for telemetry. Uh, but when I Googled this and I read this definition and it started to click, then, oh my God, this is what we're trying to do with software, right? If you apply this to software engineering, Observability just means, can you understand what's happening inside your systems just by asking questions from the outside? Can you, can you understand any system state that it can get itself into, even if you've never seen it before and could never have guessed it? Can you still identify you know, that state, what's going on? And importantly, can you answer any question about your system without shipping new code? Because, you know, it, it, if, Monitoring is about un is about known unknowns, right? Observability is about the unknown unknowns. And if you have to ship new code to handle the case, to answer the question, that implies that you needed to know in advance that, you know, blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> this is a definition that I think is incredibly useful and relevant to all of us today. And I'm not going to go into the long, okay, if you buy that definition that it's about unknown unknowns, it's about, you know, understanding the inner workings of this, blah, 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 then ipso facto, you should accept that any observability tooling must have these characteristics. Uh, and I don't have time to go into why here, but I've written at least two or three very long blog posts on the subject, and there's a link to one there. It's not observability unless it, unless it checks these boxes. Um, but the consequence of observability in your socio-technical system is that your team can quickly and reliably diagnose any new behavior with no prior knowledge, with no clues, right? And it starts with rich instrumentation. It's all about putting this constant conversation with what's happening with your code right now in production. And, spoiler alert, well-understood systems require far less time firefighting. 
So at this point, like a lot of people are like, okay, that's all very abstract, which is why um, I was asked to put in a, an example. So let's look at an example of like uh, some m questions that you would answer with monitoring versus some questions that you would answer with observability. Um, monitoring questions, like taken from a typical LAMP stack, you know, monolith type of system. Photos are loading slowly for some people. Why? Maybe the app tier capacity is exceeded because some instances are down. Or maybe the errors are high. Check the dashboard. Um, database queries are slow. Disk write. You know, all of these things are just cool. You know, if you built the system, you could probably size it up, predict 80% of the ways it would fail, write a bunch of monitoring checks for those, and for the next six months, you would figure out the remaining 20%. Okay, cool. So now let's look at the scene question. Photos are loading slowly for some people. Why? But all of these scenarios were taken from actual uh, outages at Parse or Instagram. And these require observability. sure what I'm supposed to monitor for. <laughs> These are all examples of things that have never happened before. Probably will never happen again. I don't want to waste a whole lot of time doing the whole like retro and postmortem and like write a bunch of monitoring checks and like, you know, say here's the dashboard where I'm going to find it immediately the next time. Like that kind of seems like a waste of time, honestly. Um, I've got more. <laughs> Latency reverts to historical mean on Tuesdays. I know what you're thinking, but it is not a cron job. <sighs> Some of these aren't even problems, right? They're not only are they not problems to monitor for, they are, they are simply things that needed to be deeply understood. Ugh! Why is this happening now? Like, why is it suddenly like observability? Such a hot topic. Well, because complexity is fucking out the rough. Um, it used to be that like, almost entirely no known unknowns. Like, you know, I I've been a sysadmin for many years, and like maybe once or twice a year would I be really truly stumped. Like, all hands on deck. Nobody knows what's going on. Let's figure it out, right? Now it's like that's every time you get paid. Like, literally every day. It's just like it's never like oh that again. Oh, uh, that again. We fixed those things. Now it's like, uh, <laughs> mm, every time you're starting from scratch. Everything is a high cardinality dimension now. <sighs> you know, playbooks are kind of garbage. You can't rely on your guesses and, and your, you know, pattern matching from the library of past outages that you have in, in your memory. Um, and monitoring checks are always fighting the last battle. Um, these are architecture diagrams from 2003, 2013 at Paris, and then there's the, you know, National Electrical Grid, which is really how we should be thinking of our systems from here on out, is because it's dynamic and ephemeral, and you, you know, you should not try and predict like which street <laughs> a, a tree is going to fall over on next. You you just shouldn't even try. You should just give up, embrace the fact that things are always failing, and it's fine, right? But we do have to instrument <laughs> for observability, or we'll be screwed. Um, this, you know, this is the shift from known unknowns to unknown unknowns, absolutely. <sighs> Complexity is exploding, and our tools were designed for predictable worlds. You know, our tools were designed to answer questions, and that's they do that. They answer the questions very quickly. But increasingly, the kinds of problems I'm having are not the ones where I'm like, I know the question, give me the answer. It's like, I don't know what the question is. I'm not even sure if there is a question. I have some vague symptoms and suspicions, but, and by the time I know what the, <laughs> by the time I know what the answer is, by, by the time I know what the question is, I'm going to know what the answer is too. So, we're really behind when it comes to tooling. Like, God bless time series databases, you know, monitoring metrics-based stuff, but a lot of us are back in the dark ages. We're using log files where it's 
either spewing too much or there's nothing. You have to know what you're looking for or you can't find anything. Or metrics, which are are fine for infrastructure, but they're not going to give you shit for anything that's like, you know, um, interesting. <laughs> Sorry, not trying to break. Point being, people don't even realize how much they're flying in the dark. Like, they don't know because they this is the way it's always been. And they more or less limp along. And isn't this just how computers are supposed to be? It's not, though. Um, if you really want to empower your software engineers to own their own code in production, um, observability is a prerequisite uh, because it allows you to inspect cause and effect uh, by tracing, um, by slicing and dicing. Um, it, it speaks the language of functions, endpoints, variables, etc. Without it, your team must resort to... And the problem, beyond the obvious problem of people just gonna make it really hard to run your systems, it's it's going to be a real battle for you to connect and debug even very simple feedback loops in a timely manner, which is how we're going to try and get to our high-performing teams, right? Honestly, like at this point, uh, investing in observability is kind of like just putting your glasses on before you take off down the highway. And if you're as blind as me, that's a very serious statement. Uh, um, a lot of people are like, yeah, 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 it's on the list. I'm going to get to it. Totally going to get to it. Um, but I don't have time right now. And it's like, I swear that all the shit on your list, almost all the shit on your list would go a lot faster if you could see what you were doing. Um, this is what we hear from people on the ground anyway. Uh, so, uh, I don't think, I'm not going to go into detail on these, um, Liz Fungens and I did an observability maturity model, uh, and we basically, uh, the, this is like a choose your, choose your own adventure, right? Like, you go through these, you look for yourself in the descriptions, if you're doing well or if you're doing poorly, see which one resonates with you, um, go for the one that's your biggest source of pain, there's a URL there, I think, yeah. You're all with the full thing. Uh, whichever one you're the weakest at, um, do some of the stuff that we suggest. Uh, it's just it's kind of a way to help you like f figure out where you're at and, and claw your way out of the pit. Um, but I'm not going to go into it. I just wanted to put them up for you. Um, so I want to talk about observability-driven development because this this is your lever with which you shall move the world. TDD is the most successful um, development paradigm of my lifetime, right? For very good reasons. It it um, it's very good at like stripping away all of the all of the extraneous stuff, reducing things to small like um, to <laughs> small small and uh, repeatable bits of code um, that are deterministic, and you know this is very tractable. All of the interesting things have been removed. <laughs> uh, however, these powerful strengths have become weaknesses, right? The edges of your environment stop at your laptop with testing, right? Um, your TDD stops it at your test. And staging is not production. Your laptop is definitely not production. It will never mimic it well enough for it to be meaningful. All of the interesting things that have been removed so that you can run these tests very, very predictably are the interesting things that you actually need to embrace. Um, I, I think of uh, TDD plus prod as being ODD, uh, but a better description of it here um, is with observability driven development, you are instrumenting your code as you write it as you go along. And you make a very regular daily habit of looking at the code that you have recently written after it's in production through the lens of your instrumentation as users are using it, right? Uh, you never accept a pull request unless you can answer, how will I know when, not if, when this breaks <laughs> with your instrumentation, right? Um, as You should be deploying just one, one merge set at a time. You should all right, I'm not dogmatic about this. You don't have to watch your code roll out every time. 
I ho hopefully it's being auto deployed for you anyway, and so you might have to run to catch it. But you should have a muscle memory for going to look at it once it's live, right? And looking at it through the lens of the instrumentation that you just wrote and asking yourself, is this doing what I wanted it to do? Is it working as intended? And does anything else look weird? <laughs> I swear to God, if you can get your team in the habit of doing this, like really in the habit of doing this, uh, 80, 90% of all problems will never even get as far as your users. And always wrap your code in feature flags. Always. Decoupling like deployments and releases and um, is absolutely critical. Um, the point here, I'm not going to go through this list. The point here is to improve your tools and processes with your tools and processes, doing things like this or whatever is more relevant for you using observability. You measure and then cut, right? So to sum it all up, pulling it all back together here, I'm just about done. Um, here is one of those feedback loops uh, that is <laughs> that is at the root of, of those you know one to six month time frames that we're all gawking at. Um, engineer wants to ship some small bit of code, merges the diff. Well, you know, it's not automatically deploying it, so other engineers merge their diffs too. At some point, somebody's going to bite the bullet and, you know, cross their fingers and trigger a deploy. Well, it's probably going to be a few days worth of merges, and very often it will fail. Sometimes it will take down the site, and if it takes down the site, it will probably page the on-call person. Um, and you know, the on-call person may not be aware that somebody is deploying code, and vice versa. The person who's deploying code might not be aware that somebody got paged because the site's down, mm -hmm. right? So the person who mainly rolled back is then going to just start get bisecting, just like one by one, to try and find the change if it's not obvious from the error. Try and figure out whose change did this. Every person who has merged something in this time frame is going to get pulled into this. It's going to be a mess. It's going to interrupt everybody. Their afternoons are trashed. Everybody's going to start bitching about oh, how much on-call sucks. <sighs> this can very easily eat up 50 plus engineer hours to ship this change. Especially if you count just the hours where you can't get anything done because you might get interrupted at any moment suddenly it becomes very easy to see how you only get one change out every one to six months, doesn't it? This is terrible. This is terrible. Let's look at a virtuous loop. Engineer merges diff. It automatically kicks off. You know, CICD uh, creates an artifact, deploys it everywhere. Uh-oh, deploy fails. It's the same diff, remember? Um, but um, they have it connected so that um, if the deploy fails, uh, it notifies the person who just merged the diff that went out and it automatically reverts it to a good, safe state um, while the person can investigate. Of course, you know, he instrumented, so he immediately spots the error, uh, takes a couple minutes to add some tests and instrumentation to better detect it in advance, commits a fix. Engineering time to ship this change, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, one person. <laughs> Same change. This kind of thing is not even uh, this is not even an exaggeration. And these things get compounded day after day, week, week after week. And that's how you get to, <laughs> that's how you get to these sad, sad stories. <laughs> it's not just who's going to be a better engineer either. Who's going to be happier? Who's going to like their job more? Who's going to be more excited to go to work in the morning? Matters a lot. Time to stop flying blind. Um, you don't have to buy honeycomb, but get you some high cardinality, get you some high dimensionality, get you some arbitrarily wide structured data blobs, and the ability to slice and dice uh, ad hoc without having to predefine schemas or indexes or any of that shit that will drag you down. The point is to be able to move fast with confidence. The whole Friday deploy argument was um, a lot of heat and light surrounding the obvious fact that so many people have never worked in a system that they trusted. And that's sad. Use the principles of observability driven. This is not, this is not replacing TDD, but it is subsuming it. It is extending it. It is adding reality back into it uh, and moving code to production as quickly as possible. It can be behind feature flags. That's fine. It doesn't have to be used, but get it out there. Ship faster and safer and watch those door metrics go up. 
in order to spend this this is a snowball snowball of awesomeness right the snow just just the same way that it's a snowball of terribleness when things start going poorly you reclaim a little bit of time uh, and then you can use that time on reclaiming more time and 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 making things better and and suddenly you're doing 10 times as much with you know the same number of people when you're looking for a job find people who are excited about this find people who teams that honor and value this sort of like intentional you know team you know curating and building the team processes and tooling um can constantly improving how they operate a, 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 a tell for this is teams that value hiring junior engineers at look for teams that are humble and relentlessly focused on investing in their core business differentiators not looking to run their own shit because it's fun <laughs> Um, look for ways to save time. Everybody here should be shipping in five minutes or less. That's a reasonable amount of time. Where are we going? Well, here's here's the truth. Like the next generation of systems, we have outgrown this the the playbook model where you can just write down what to do if a thing happens. Uh, systems like modern systems, next generation systems, uh. They're not going to be built by burned out and exhausted people because they're too hard. They're too complicated. They're too all consuming <laughs> and they take too much of your creative self. Um, people who have not, um, people who've not modernized their tool stacks uh, are really hurting. Our, our systems are emergent and unpredictable. We need your creative selves. In the future, like on call needs to be shared by everyone who writes code. There's a pact here between engineers who, who agree to be on call and managers who agree that on call must not be terrible. It must not be something you have to plan your life around. It must not be something that regularly impacts your sleep. I think that being woken up two or three times a year is reasonable. Invest in your deploys, instrument everything, democratize ownership, data, as much as possible and spend your time focusing on those feedback loops. On call should be less like a heart attack and more like a dentist appointment. <laughs> and don't be too scared off by regulations. Uh, if, if the security team is telling you that it's impossible because blah blah blah, they're wrong. It's not. In conclusion, your labor is scarce and precious. Give it to those who are worthy of it, please. We only get one career. <laughs> Picking or growing a high-performing team is what will let us spend more time learning and building amazing new things, not dragged down by tech debt and shitty processes, wasting our life force. We have an opportunity to make things better. Let's do it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charity. I hope by uh, this time everyone understands that uh, everything starts with the right culture, with the right mindset. And uh, Charity, I think, gave a compelling story uh, proving this point. And I hope that we will all be able to build our teams around these uh, topics and make sure that our teams stay productive. Because the more productive time we have, uh, the more we'll be able to 